Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Eric Bergloff, who is Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics. He's also the Chief Economist of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, the Beijing-based multilateral development bank established in 2016 with a mission to improve social and economic outcomes in Asia. Welcome, Eric. Thank you very much. So, so, so you have two jobs now uh, between London and, and Beijing. Uh, the, the, uh, the good part of our conversation today uh, is about an essay that you wrote about uh, the COVID-19, uh, especially um, with a focus on the developing world. You say in this essay, the COVID-19 pandemic is now in a new phase where evolutionary pressures on the virus are building up. The entire world is racing to vaccinate enough people before the virus has changed sufficiently to escape immunity from previous infections or vaccines. Uh, But now we are not winning this race in much of the emerging and developing world, leaving everyone vulnerable to the mutating virus. But why do you say we are not winning this race? Well, I I think there is uh, very clear that if you look at what happened sort of at at the global level, the rich countries and the big countries have been able to scramble for vaccines and and taken uh, you know the bulk of the vaccines uh, until very recently a few weeks ago but essentially no nothing had gone to the developing uh, and emerging parts of the world so there are now some some initial positive signs but you know they're still trickled in, compared to what is needed yeah yeah, it is uh, the problem. This is a systemic problem, right? So uh, it, it doesn't really matter if the US or EU get 70% of the people vaccinated. The problem to solve ultimately is to get to herd immunity, get about 6 billion people vaccinated um, because we are traveling all around the place and you cannot contain something like this as we found out from the, mm-hmm. uh, from the pandemic as well as the, the variants that are emerging from different parts of the world. So th- th- is, that, is that the problem that we are not really focusing on the entire system of 8.3 billion people? Well, I think it's very important uh, what you said, you know, until you know, the virus is extinguished everywhere. We are not, we are not safe anywhere. So, so I think that's a very um, important uh, thing to remember. Actually, I was part of a, of a panel of, of um, scientists, epidemiologists, uh, virologists, and, and I was sort of token economist, and we had even an anthropologist. And we looked at, starting from different sci- science scenarios, what will happen to virus, uh, what will happen to vaccines, to antivirals, you know, to, to um, fight p- for people who, who are have actually got the infection and so on. And one thing that we concluded from that um, exercise is that, you know, in, this vi- virus will be with us, will, as we call, endemic, and will be 
with us for for the foreseeable future and maybe forever. And it could be that actually what's happened now is that we have introduced a new disease that uh, will be with mankind for for you know for a very long time. And you know even we talk about herd immunity, you know what we have seen, and that's why these variants are important because we are now seeing that in some places where these evolutionary pressures that I mentioned are particularly high, when maybe there are high rates of people who had infections and 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 um, you know, so that puts pressure on on the virus to become more effective. And we see now that it manages to, even people who had uh, COVID-19 can get it again. And uh, some uh, vaccines are not working against these variants. So of course, that makes countries even more eager to, and, and particularly the, the rich and powerful countries, to vaccinate only not only 60 or 70 percent, which is sort of the the number that people talk about for what you call herd immunity, they're actually now aiming for 100% because they don't feel that they, they, you know, they can guarantee herd immunity. So, you know, there is a, a very uh, real possibility also that, you know, once these vaccines reach the developing world and, and the emerging world on, on a larger scale, that these vi uh, vaccines are no longer uh, even effective. I, I mean, it's a bit of a, you know, um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but it's, it's a very real possibility. And people have worked on on immunity and so on. They are not very convinced. And we know that, um, you know, for, for certain things, uh, you know, these are recurring, maybe even annual vaccinations you will have to have to, to, um, to, 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 to manage, uh, uh, maintain the immunity. So, you know, a lot of unanswered questions, and of course, we know a lot more now than we did a year ago, but there's still a lot of uncertainty, both in the scientific dimension, but also on the social science dimension. And we have learned a lot, but as I said, you know, the, there are so many questions left to to understand. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, from a scientific perspective, it is clear that the viral load, and, and you have to look at the world as a system, uh, is going to be uh, proportional to the probability of variants emerging. And so it doesn't really matter if you have a few countries fully vaccinated, as long as the virus exists at some level around the world, it is going to create variants, it is going to get uh, it mutate. And then the question is, as you say, um, we might end up with sort of, uh, so we have the seasonal flu vaccine, we've been struggling with flu forever, uh, we haven't been able to conquer that, so we have a seasonal flu vaccine. We might end up with a uh, a cocktail mm -hmm. of vaccines every season that might include uh, maybe a you know a, a set of variants mm -hmm. uh, of COVID. Then, from an implementation perspective, as you say, the compliance rate for flu, I think, in the U.S. is something like fifty percent. Mm -hmm. EU is in that range, but it is not at all prevalent mm -hmm. in the developing world. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to rely on sort of a, a, a cocktail of vaccines to be given to 6 billion people every year, that is going to create a huge implementation challenge, right? We are not even able to do the first one. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, so, so uh, exactly. We can talk a little bit about the, the first one, you know, the, the, the coordination exercise that's going on at the moment. Uh, I would argue that it's the most ambitious and most comprehensive coordination exercise we have ever tried to undertake. Because it's not, we're not talking about sort of traditional immunization, which mostly focused on, on uh, children. And now we're talking about whole populations and uh, also working in sometimes very difficult areas. And as you, you know, you could even have, you know, conflict zones where we'll ever, never ever be able to reach with, um, you know, with immunization campaigns. So even in those very, maybe geographically uh, constrained um, environments, uh, the virus can persist. So that's why it's so important now to early on get a very broad um, uh, delivery. Uh, and there are very nice and, and well thought out um, uh, schemes for getting this in place, but it, it just has taken a long time to, to get them to start to work. There's something called COVAX, which basically is trying to at least provide you know, 20 percent um, of the population in the poorest countries, and that it took a long to get start, long time to get started. 
but the sort of positive news that I mentioned earlier is that actually these first COVAX uh, vaccine deliveries have now arrived in, in Africa. And of course, to have the vaccine there is just the one first step because then you have to, you know, get it out to where it's supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, people are going to be immunized. You have to get the people to come to, you have to store it. Some of these vaccines require extreme cold and so on. So, you know, and you wouldn't have to keep track of who was vaccinated. And these are very complex exercises. And, and uh, you know, unfortunately, it, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a very real uh, possibility that we uh, will not, uh, in this first, even in this first effort, uh, manage to, to reach the, the levels that we need. Yeah, it is a complex exercise. Anecdotally, Eric, uh, I live in the U.S., as you know. Uh, I'm in the 50s. I got my first dose a couple of weeks ago. My parents live in South India. My dad is in the 80s. My mom is in the 70s. And they just got their first dose mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago. Um, Did they get the Indian uh, uh, vaccine? or? Yeah, I don't know exactly what, which one they got. Mm -hmm. It sounds like the Indian mm -hmm. uh, vaccine. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but uh, I was a bit confused because they said 28 days uh, second dose was needed. Uh, but I don't know much about the the Indian vaccine. But I mean, it does, it so that's quite standard. I mean, the, these uh, times between uh, uh, jabs are, are, are a bit arbitrary, and for some it's a longer. For I think we don't know for sure exactly what is the right um, interval. And, and there are some vaccines now that only require one jab, but most require two jabs. So. Yeah, and you know, if you like, if you take India for example, to get the herd immunity, there you got to get one billion doses in total, and um, just keeping the records. This hasn't been tried before, as you say, and and China is uh, potentially in the same state. I don't know a lot of <laughs> a lot of information on China, uh, and then uh, Africa hasn't even started. Um, you you mentioned in this uh, in this essay, uh, you know, you, you sort of um, existing uh, resistance. So perhaps previous infections, uh, previous um, uh, even vaccines. Uh, there was some speculation that BCG, the vaccine against TB, was somewhat effective against COVID. Um, do, do you have any information from China that that tells us that the prevalence of COVID could be a lot lower in the developing world for for whatever reasons? No, I think first of all, it, it, there are a lot of. Let me try, let's try to unpack the the question because it had many components. So first of all, I think what we see uh, that some countries in Asia and China is one of them, but also Taiwan, Vietnam, very importantly, uh, uh, Korea even in Cambodia, you know, several countries that have been remarkably successful. And, you know, basically the, the strategy has been to, you know, hit very early. So in China's case, basically closing down the whole economy and uh, basically have a zero tolerance. I can talk more about how, how that works because I'm living in that environment at the moment. Uh, Korea yeah. has used a very different method, which is really about um, trying to uh, test and track or, and, and then in that way, uh, keep the the the, uh, the number of infections down. So there are many strategies, and I think these strategies, the choice of strategies, reflect, of course, uh, to some extent, uh, the cultures, but and and possibly also the sort of economic and political systems. But I think more importantly, they reflect recent experience. So so um, you know, we had SARS in in China, and then of course Vietnam has ex had experienced that. We had something called MERS that affected Korea. So there are, I think, historical experience matters a lot, and both at the level of uh, of what governments and and you know medical institutions do, but also how people react. And I think one very important lesson, actually one that I think is is perhaps the most single most important for thinking about future um, uh, kind of pandemics, is that people respond to information and they make their own assessment ap apply you know their uh, their beliefs so you know if they're told like in some countries that this is not a, a very dangerous thing it's like you know I, I 
can get you know don't, don't need to cite people but you can you know there were leaders there were even prominent scientists who were saying this is like a, a cold you don't worry about it you know if you get those conflicting signals people that will affect people's response so i think there's also uh, i can give you one a, a sort of interesting piece of, of research which shows a little bit also why why it's important to think about these um, individual responses uh, you know in addition to the sort of government policy. So there, there's a study that looks at uh, Denmark and Sweden and, and basically uses some uh, data from a bank that had customers in Sweden and Denmark. And Sweden had a very, as you probably have heard about, this was had a very liberal kind of uh, policy yeah. that, you know, this is, and there was even early discussions that we, let's go to herd immunity and, and then we'll be fine and, and we just manage that. Yeah. I think that as we know now, you know Sweden is a, is a, um, a, 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 a very tragic failure, and you know the number of deaths are about you know at the order of ten times what you have in the other Nordic countries. Denmark chose a very different way, so that's why it's interesting to compare what happened to 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 people's behavior. So so what this article does is that it looks at consumption patterns. How much did people uh, adjust their consumption, and and the the rough neighborhood is that say. On about 25 percent of consumption reduced um, in both countries just uh, um, because of individual behavior so people responded in the same way independent of whether there were rules or not and then the rules yeah. added maybe another four percent so you can see that it's that individual responsibility or, or response is, is so important but that government intervention also mattered because did that those four percent were very concentrated on the impact on young people in and so in in Denmark where they have stricter rules these rules affected very much the consumption patterns of, of young people these are the super spreaders if you want and so they managed to yeah. contain that very interestingly also in Denmark the consumption of older people was higher and that also makes sense because older people felt felt safer when these uh, rules were in place and there, there were restrictions on, on movement, you, you know, wearing masks and those things. So, you know, these are we are still in the very early phase of learning about how individuals, uh, households, uh, and, and so on re re react and respond to this. And, and none of this, if you look, go back and look at the sort of epidemic uh, models that were used at the early stages of, of this pandemic. None of them capture this. And I think there's been a lot of research and hopefully when we come out of this pandemic, that has been one of the most important insights is that we need to integrate into these um, various uh, uh, epidemic models, uh, this human behavior and, and, and the fact that people will look at the information they have, will look at the behavior of others and so on. And, and um, so, so, so I think there are, so many lessons to be had from this uh, from this experience yeah yeah hopefully we'll learn from it uh, i'm not that optimistic mm -hmm. eric uh, humans uh, typically don't learn a lot uh, from, from previous experiences no, well you say that but as i uh, gave you some examples i think of where actually these yeah. things are so traumatic and as we see now and and you know the experience that people had in 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 china in uh, from sars the experience that people had from MERS in, in, in uh, Korea, you know, they may decay over time, but they are sufficiently recent to really uh, affect behavior today. Is my, is my, but I agree that, you know, there's also a lot of, of uh, you know, collective uh, uh, sort of Alzheimer's or, you know, the people do, do forget. The, as you say, culture and political systems matter. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, we can look at um, US, UK, Brazil mm -hmm. example and contrast that, albeit, uh, you know, smaller countries, New Zealand, Taiwan, South Korea. And you can see how these countries actually went about uh, tackling the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, very different approaches, as you say, and very different results as well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, people tend to say it's a scale problem. Uh, but uh, it's unclear if it's just a scale well, problem. What it by is, scale it, problem? So. Uh, scale problem meaning it's easy for New Zealand to tackle mm, something I, I, like no, this. I, it's I not. This is uh, 
this is bogus. Yeah. I mean, so so I think that what it's important to some extent for New Zealand was that it's an island, you know, a small, relatively small island, but it's an island that can very easily and did very early on uh, regulate, uh, you know, flights in and out of, of New Zealand. You know, Australia has had a, you know, it's a larger island if you want, has, uh, has yeah. uh, you know, had a very uh, interesting strategy of, you know, basically have very open as soon as there was uh, the least infection, you may have seen this during the Australian Open, the tennis tournament that, you know, they clamped down immediately, a lockdown and, you know, some, you know, Melbourne, for example, has been through, you know, several lockdowns, but they have really managed to sort of nip it in the bud and, and reduce the number of infections, but, but most importantly, the number of, of deaths. So, so I think, again, that, I think we should think about many different strategies, but basically all of them are trying to get at this early on that is both from a sort of humanitarian uh, ethical point of view superior, but also from an actually a purely economic point of view. So if you look at China now, you know, the China's economy is booming and it's, uh, you know, it, it did close down and there was some severe impact and people made big sacrifices in, in the early part of 2020. But now the economy is back, you know, people meet and open, have go to restaurants, you know, the economy is booming, the Chinese exports are doing very well and so on. So, you know, there is this discussion that we have seen, particularly in the US around, you know, these, um, you know, we have to save the economy to let the virus loose. You know, this is, I think, a, a, a very flawed, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of approach or a kind of logic behind that. But of course, it makes it much harder to, to do the kind of strategies that Australia has done and, and, and Korea has done and what China has done if you don't act early. If you have these kind of mixed messages that you had in the US and that you had in, in, uh, in uh, also in the UK, I think it's a good example, very confusing messages and then shifting strategy in the middle. And of course, we see you know, the number of deaths have been, uh, you know, very high. Actually, the two countries that, you know, when you looked at, uh, at the, um, you know, at what you call the pandemic preparedness index that was constructed before the pandemic, yeah. the US and the UK were highest. And, you know, those are the countries with, you know, among, you know, if you're not, uh, which certainly are very high up there in terms of number of deaths per, uh, per capita. So, you know, we, I think we, we have also learned that pandemic preparedness is, um, you know, something that we, you know, don't fully understand or at least didn't fully understand. And we have learned something about that as well. Yeah. yeah preparing is one thing, mm -hmm. Eric. Uh, what we also learned from this uh, cycle is that leadership matters. Uh, leadership, when something bad happens, uh, really mm -hmm. matters. Uh, want to differentiate how countries tackle this, you can go straight to their mm -hmm. leaders and uh, you will get a very high correlation between what the leaders were doing and what the outcomes have been. It's not that difficult uh, to get that data, to analyze that data. You have a larger point in the essay. Uh, you say that we could piggyback onto this most ambitious of global coordination exercises to build up resilient health systems prepare for future pandemics and expand towards universal health coverage. Um, could, you, could you expand on that a little bit? Well, why, do you, why are you optimistic that this will allow us to create a more resilient... No, so I, I think so, so the point I want to make is that, you know, we have had, um, should I say, wavering support for this global um, vaccination effort. And there are reasons for that, because as I alluded to earlier, vaccinations are very... Um, particular exercises are very specialized uh, entities and there's not a lot of experience like you know the the, the uh, bank I work for the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and it's a new bank and it hasn't really done anything on health before um, uh, COVID came and now in the last year it's done almost everything has been in one way or another health related but you know now we have uh, decided or we are thinking about how to uh, create a, a stronger or, or, or build a, a health 
business, if you want, and I have actually been in charge of thinking that through. What you really must understand there that to to work in the health in general requires a lot of capacity. It's a very it's fraught with uh, market failures, as we say, and government failures, and and you know very heavy regulated areas. So you need a lot of institutional understanding. So first, but if you then take this to the vaccination project, it's, it's even worse because you know when you go in and and do these kind of vaccination campaigns, first of all you have to you know choose which vaccine, and that's a very complicated process, and and also um there's not very transparent process by the way the prices are not really revealed often and so on but then you have to decide you know who's going to get it first every country goes through this uh, or, or, or the, at least the countries that have vaccines now they go through this process and it, you know it's very sensitive you know some countries decide to protect the vulnerable other countries say we should try to rid you know make get get rid of, of the of those who are most likely to spread, even though vaccines, we don't know very much how, how much they help against spreading. You know, others say that we should, uh, you know, make sure that the working population is vaccinated. You know, so, and these are very profound um, decisions that it's very hard for any outside organization to to really um, uh, intervene in. So these decisions have to come out of some kind of you know, whatever democratic or whatever political process you have in a country. So, so that's the first thing. But then, you, you know, you have often there are security concerns. So traditionally, a lot of vaccination efforts have been about, you know, we call it fly by night operations because of security concerns for health workers and, and maybe even for the people who uh, get these vaccines. Because in some countries, of course, there are a lot of, you know, uh, bad information of, about what the vaccines are and, and what why they are being vaccinated and there have been maybe abuses and so so I'm just saying these are very complicated things so for institutions to take on this kind of business it's it's very uh, it's very striking that that uh, few even the World Bank which has you know more than a thousand people you know, including their consultants working on health there are very few people who know something about vaccination and maybe one or two people who know something about vaccinating a whole population and then you have to go to units of, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. just saying the, the complexity here when it comes to delivery of you know procurement and buying vaccines may be complicated itself but then you have to deploy vaccination logistics you know all all the things that come with that yeah I mean the, the issue is it's a worldwide problem and it's unclear to me, Eric, uh, you, you can let me know. It's unclear to me if there is any world organization, including the WHO, uh, is in a position to tackle a worldwide pandemic problem. Um, I don't know if they have the resources, if they have the power, uh, if they have the authority to do anything about it. If we don't have a worldwide organization, uh, in this context, pandemics are here to stay, as most scientists uh, would think. Uh, this is just the first iteration. We're going to have many iterations like this. And if you don't have a worldwide organization, we're going to get this patchwork of, um, of um, interventions by different countries. Uh, and it's, it's not going to really help us uh, to actually solve the problem. So do you see are there organizations, um, worldwide organizations, who can step into, um, you know, sort of thinking about this more holistically? Yeah, I was actually part of an exercise, a very interesting exercise that uh, the G20 uh, commissioned under the German presidency. And, and uh, there was a report presented in 2018. Uh, and it was focusing not just on, on pandemics, but it was focusing on, on sort of the global financial system in terms of development and in terms of financial stability. And of course, we see now that, you know, a pandemic is very, you know, it's, it's you know, killing people, getting people sick, you know, affecting growth, but, it, but it's also uh, affecting uh, financial stability and so on. So we thought a lot uh, about it uh, uh, at the time. And, and I think there is, there are some ideas for how to, create what we call sort of global platforms. And they have to look different for different types of global challenges. They look different from, 
for climate and and maybe for uh, you know migration and so on. But for when it comes to pandemic response, it's very clear that there has to be a an institution that can lead this with a, with a political because it's as I emphasized there are so many political decisions and that are of course very profound uh, scientific um, uh, decisions to make. And you know the best thing we have is the WHO and. Now, if we didn't have it, we would have to invent it. Of course, a lot has been done, as you know, to to undermine it over the and and you know there. Are, I'm not saying that there are problems with WHO for sure, but you don't want to really address those problems in the middle of a pandemic. So I I think that we have done WHO a disservice, and I actually work a lot now with uh, WHO here in 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 Asia, and uh, you know they have a lot of yeah. competence, a lot of experience, but again they they have become politicized, you know, in different ways by different countries. But I think particularly, uh, uh, how should I put it, particularly seriously in, 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 in the pandemic response. And, you know, they, they, yeah. but even WHO does not have this experience uh, on, on vaccinating uh, full population. So we, they have to build those kind of, of uh, expertise and the UNICEF has been very important for vaccination and so I think the, the lesson from all this is that we need a system with uh, institutions like the WHO and UNICEF for so the medical and political leadership and then you need the what you call the multilateral development bank you know like like AIB to help deliver and you know build uh, health systems that are more resilient I think one of the lessons that we draw from this pandemic is that you know, there were such deep fragilities in in really in just basic healthcare that has amplified the impact of, of the pandemic. And of course, a lot of other things, also social inequity and, and, and so on, and the difference across the effect on women and men, all those things have come out and, and we need to think about, you know, when the next pandemic comes, because it will come and, and most likely it will come more often because of the things that are happening to our climate and the fact that we are increasingly moving into areas where you get these kind of jumps of viruses from animals to humans and, and you know, get that whole uh, process started again. So we need to seriously think what are the lessons uh, from, from, from this experience. Yeah. So, uh, so Eric, you are chief economist of the Asian mm-hmm. Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB. What what is the what is the remit of AIIB? Well, so, so so first of all, you know we are a very new institution. Uh, it was it has now uh, 103 shareholders. I think it it thinks of itself or we think of ourselves as as really trying to look at the world also from the perspective of the emerging and, and developing kind of. Certainly, I think see my own role as a as a chief economist to to really try to see. For example, as I've tried to convey now in, in thinking about this um, pandemic, that you know what is what does the world look like for, from these countries, and how can we um, get policies, build institutions that better uh, represent those countries and, and better support their growth for their response to to the pandemic. I think that's very core to to what AIB does. Of course, AIB was created initially for physical infrastructure. But increasingly, then became for digital infrastructure, and and now we see you know, mm. what happened in in uh, in the pandemic that you know a lot of this uh, um, physical infrastructure is underutilized or or you know completely locked down because of the pandemic, and at the same time you know a lot of the opportunities that have been created come from the digital dimension that people have been able to in in some countries and in some professions work remotely and, and manage to, but of course this is very uneven and these kind of digital divides have been, you know, emphasized or uh, made more uh, uh, visible because of, of the pandemic. I think, you know, if you look at it, if you want to take something positive out of the pandemic, uh, it is that it has accelerated and development was already underway, but I think the world will not look the same in, in this respect after the pandemic and and i think there's also hope that if we can push these um, uh, digital access into a much broader uh, part of, of the world and part of, of the population that that can have very significant um, 
a development uh, effect and, and affect people's uh, lives and livelihoods in, in very profound ways. Yeah, so AIB, so where, where does the funding no, come sorry, from it's, for it's AIB? A, what you call a multilateral development bank. It has, uh, as I said, 103 shareholders. So 103 countries have paid in. China uh, is the largest shareholder. Uh, and, you know, it's like one one third or, or a little bit less of, of the of the capital. Uh, there are other big shareholders are Korea um, and, and India, for example. Actually, But the, the largest country operation, as we say, the country where most of the money from AIB is invested uh, is in, in India. So it's about one fifth of the portfolio is in India. And, and of course, uh, working in, in different parts of India, trying to build infrastructure. We know that India has you know, less infrastructure per you know, than what you would expect given its uh, population and its level of development. So there are very large needs uh, in, in India. But, you know, that's true for other countries in in Asia as well. And, and you know, that's, I think, what AIB was created to meet. There was, of course, the Asian Development Bank already, but I think the perception was that there was this wasn't sufficient to, to meet the very large need, but these economies are growing very fast, you know, growing populations, huge needs to adjust these economies to, you know, to reduce the impact on climate and eventually, you know, move to, you know, net zero carbon and so on. All those changes, you know, giving people access to jobs, uh, you know, dealing with large migration pressures uh, into cities. And so all those things require massive infrastructure investment. So that, and I think, or, you know, there will be room for more institutions for sure, but, but, uh, for me, it's very exciting to work at the at the new institutions. I worked at slightly older institutions, and there are all these questions of that you ask about. You know, what is the purpose? We're kind of thinking about them almost on a, on, a, uh, on a daily basis because you know there are decisions that we make that will impact where the bank goes in the future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. You say uh, it was it was conceived uh, with a focus on physical infrastructure, but increasingly you are thinking about yeah. the digital infrastructure. Uh, the pandemic um, uh, may have accelerated the need for digital infrastructure. Uh, I don't know what it's going to do to the physical infrastructure. Perhaps one could argue the physical transport of humans uh, perhaps will decline. So many of the conventional uh, physical infrastructure needs uh, may decline. But on the other hand, uh, the digital infrastructure requirements are going to be a lot higher. So in some sense, uh, perhaps optimistically, this might be a way to leapfrog, um, you know, from, uh, from where you are uh, in large Asian countries and, and really focus on how the future might look like. Is that, is no, that I, I think that about it? Uh, we should probably not completely... Uh, uh, leave out the physical infrastructure. It's still very important for for livelihoods and people's you know standard of living in 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 in, in you know, particularly in rural areas. But also you know the there is a lot of issues around infrastructure in in in, uh, in the big cities as well. So you know it's not like this will not uh, there will continue to be growing needs for that. But I, I do agree that there is an opportunity for uh, for uh, Asia and, and for emerging and developing countries to perhaps, as you say, leapfrog to, to pass over some development stages. And you know, there are many examples of this. So, for example, look if you look at, at China, and it's, it's, it's very interesting when you live here, that you know, a big problem in China historically has been that you know, the life, uh, if you live in remote areas, have been you know, very poor, very poor access to finance, poor access to goods, you know, very uh, um, uh, you know, few, uh, no health services, all those things. But actually today, you know, this is a remarkable achievement by combination of, you know, these online cells, you know, Alibaba and, and so on, as Taobao, as they call it here, yeah. that has increased the range of goods available, you know, to these uh, communities and to these uh, people. In, in you know, dramatically, so basically, wherever you live in China, in, in a big city like Shanghai or Beijing, or or you know, in very remote areas, in you know, in Xinjiang or wherever, you know, you have access to the same goods. But more importantly, you also have access to uh, 
means of finance that were just impossible because the the, the banks didn't reach or or you know the methods for getting information were so uh, antiquated and so on you know through these um, digital payment systems that they have now we you know we call it wechat or Al, uh, alipay and so on these are fantastically efficient and and uh, has radically changed the lives for, for people and, and this is in a way a, a sense of of, of, of leapfrogging it's it's a kind of financial development model that we haven't seen before that at such you know a lower level of, of development you get this incredible um, um, spread of, of, of access and you know we are going into health as i said digital health opens up similar possibilities now you, there are techniques that you can put people for example that are uh, here in, in china and also in, in in many other places actually in the world there are um, midwives walking around with a little backpack with equipment that allows them to go to to pregnant women and and then send the signals uh, from the uh, examinations or the test results and so on to some hospital maybe in another part of the world and get almost immediate responses and you know that's a whole new way sort of you know in the chinese context of barefoot yeah. doctors you can there are now like telephone booths that you can go into uh, in china and you can get a, a complete uh, kind of uh, health check and you can wherever you are in china I mean, this is not fully disseminated yet but i think these are opening up you know fantastic opportunities to you know not only um, financial and and access to goods but also access to health Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to finish up with one other thought you have in the paper. You say, finally, and perhaps most crucially, more of the production and even research should happen in the emerging and developing world. One of the things that we learned uh, is uh, in this episode is, is really the risk of concentration, risk of concentration in supply chains, um, risk of concentration in other aspects of uh, research and development and manufacturing. Um, are, are you suggesting, uh, Kia, that I don't know what the mechanism might be, but uh, sort of a broad idea that uh, you, you have to think about risk management in a more distributed fashion uh, for the world? Uh, yeah, as you say, pandemics are going to be here um, over and over. This is just a start of a cycle. And so if you're going to manage the risk, the, the future risk, it has to be more distributed. Yeah, that's, that's a very good summary, and I, maybe I'll give some examples of, of what, what I have in mind. So, so I've, I've worked a lot with uh, building kind of intellectual environments, uh, supporting policy in different countries, and the whole point behind that has been that you know it's, you can't have megaphones sitting in Washington or wherever, uh, you know, London, Brussels, wherever. And telling people in, around the world that this, you know, this is what you're going to do, and long lists of things that you're going to implement. That's not how it works, and it will never be accepted, and will never work uh, as as we would like. You need to have people who sit in 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 uh, different parts of the world, think on their own, connected to these international uh, maybe research centers and so on. But they should have their own research capacity to, to be able to absorb and and take. Uh, information that comes from maybe some of these you know, uh, famous universities and so on. That's uh, how we build, I think, policy in general. But on the pandemic side, I think it's particularly important. I, and that's an example. I have a friend who is a, a very prominent um, uh, researcher on pandemics. And, and so on. He, he worked building a research hospital in Hanoi for 15 years. And it's the whole like, thinking behind that was that, you know, if you're going to respond to a global pandemic, you cannot sit again, you know, in Washington or wherever and just give orders and now you do this and that. First of all, you, you don't know the local context. You don't know exactly what it looks like. And uh, you may also get the information quite late. So it's very important, even if you cannot build this the same depth and the same, you know, scale of research uh, in each individual country, that you need to have a group who thinks of it on its own. And frankly speaking, you know, I think the very important part of what happened in, in, in Vietnam, which has had almost no deaths from, uh, from uh, the pandemic, yeah. it was a combination, as I said, of the 
history, the, the recent experience, but also the fact that they had very significant thinking capacity on their own and, and try to see, you know, how do we respond in a science, scientific way, but also how do we respond in a sort of uh, pandemic, epidemic uh, response and a social sense. Similarly, in, in, in Wuhan, there was actually a center that had been partly connected to the Hanoi Center, but also connected to some uh, institutions in the UK that very early on, you know, put up the the uh, the, uh, the DNA sequence of the virus. You got this explosion of of, uh, of scientific activity because there was this local capacity, and that has been the base, I think, for for vaccines coming so quickly. I mean, this is really uh, unprecedented speed in in generating vaccines. And it comes to some extent, at least, from this more decentralized uh, uh, system that you need to respond to, to different global challenges. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, this has been great. Uh, oh, Eric, thank you. I so really enjoyed it. And, and, and uh, I think you, you have really put the, the finger at some very important issues. So thank you for having me. Sure, yeah. Thanks so much. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.